Oh, hi there. Welcome to Tomorrow Orbit.12.13. <laughs> My name is Jade Kim. This here is Jared Head. And today we have the exquisite honor of sitting down with Brittany Zimmerman of the Paragon Space Development Corporation. It's an innovative world class aerospace company that specializes in life support and thermal control in extreme environments. Hello, Brittany. Um, can you explain hi. anything that I just said about Paragon? <laughs> yes, I can do that for you. So what our company does is a uh, life support system. So that is keeping people alive, um, not like a doctor, but in equipment, essentially on board spacecrafts, uh, habitats for planetary surface operations, uh, spacesuits, um, and we do it in extreme environments. So our primary area um, is in space applications, but we also do terrestrial applications as well. Very neat. So can you explain a little bit more about the aspect of life support? So like you said, not like a doctor, but in that basically just having people survive. So can you explain a little bit about what goes into that? Yeah, for sure. There are a lot of portions that go into uh, keeping people alive in space. So one of the things that we specialize in is water reclamation because water is obviously an important uh, substance to have during any mission for life. Um, we do air revitalization, um, we do radiation protection, we do thermal control systems. Um, so basically, if you think about a mission going out into space that would only utilize robotics, that is not something we probably specialize in. As soon as you add human exploration into any of your missions, that's kind of where we come in. So it's you know, temperature control, nutrients, water, um, air, uh, making sure that pressure control is correct. Uh, we do uh, humidity condensate, so making sure that the correct amount of moisture is in the air and not condensing on um, any of your instrumentation. It's, um, we do radiators, for example, as well. So we have a lot of stuff going on. Very cool. <clears throat> so then, with what you guys have developed thus far, what kind of applications can be made in terms of, I guess what I'm asking is how extreme can, uh, how extreme of an environment can these systems uh, acclimate to? Uh, some pretty extreme, uh, obviously space is not made for uh, human life to exist easily. <laughs> um, so we, ha we can operate in vacuum, um, we do a lot of stuff terrestrially as well. So we do a dive suits, so uh, high pressure applications as well as uh, vacuum applications. Um, we do some stuff for the mining industry. Um, in the past, we've done that. So I can't think of many environments in which we wouldn't be able to operate. Maybe high acidity environments. So I don't think we've jumped into that. But other than that, I think we've, we've done it all. Very cool. And Brittany, um, you know, I'm sure you guys work in things like vacuum and, and high and low temperatures and other things like that. Um, and Wicked is asking in our chat room, uh, does your work include uh, MMOD shields, which is micrometeoroid uh, shields? You know, keeping yourself free of extra holes seems like a fairly important part of keeping someone alive in space, which is a pretty good point that they bring up. Yeah, certainly. So um, MMOD is something that we take into consideration, but we don't necessarily make shields for it. So the structural component of a spacecraft is usually designed by another company. Um, but what we are responsible for um, is being able to continue life support if some sort of breach of the barrier were to occur. So we have um, leak rates associated with different MMODs that were, if they were to break through the shell of a spacecraft, how much oxygen, uh, nitrogen, what kind of pressures would we be, need to be able to pump into the environment to keep astronauts alive for a required period of time with certain, um, with certain requirements from whichever spacecraft we're working on at the time to ensure that uh, the crew would have an appropriate amount of time to fix that problem and still be maintained. Got it. And kind of going off of that, a question I had as well as Travis Neal from the chat um, asked, didn't Paragon do the life support assessment for Mars One or did they refute it? No, uh, Paragon, uh, that was before my time with Paragon, but Paragon, I believe they did Inspiration Mars. And I'd have to ask Barry if we did Mars One or not, but I think that um, we definitely looked into it. What the conclusions were on that, I'm not exactly sure. 
Yeah. So <laughs> interesting stuff uh, about that then. Uh, <laughs> so just to kind of, you know, talk a little bit um, about how Paragon themselves work. Uh, Destructor1701 uh, is asking sort of like, what's the mode of operation for Paragon? Paragon? Are you a manufacturing hardware? Do you consult sub subcontracting on design work or do you do a mix of both of those? So we do a lot of stuff. Um, I think it makes for a healthy business model, of course. So we do a lot of, um, we do some manufacturing in house. So we do have uh, our own manufacturing department, um, but it's it's mostly utilized for uh, a few programs. Um, we do a little bit of outsourcing for manufacturing work, but a lot of the engineers utilize our manufacturing departments in order to fabricate uh, prototypes and things like that because we do a lot of research and development. So we do a lot of SBIR contracts and we do do subcontracting. Um, and we use our manufacturing department a lot in order to, you know, uh, proof of concept or feasibility studies on some of our lower phase uh, SBIRs or STTRs. Um, we do a lot of government, we do a lot of, uh, government contracts, but we also do private contracts. So we're kind of all over the board. Um, and I think that's really nice because as things ebb and flow in the industry, as we all know, they do, um, we kind of always have something that we're looking at, uh, working on. So I think it also gives a lot of the engineers a wide spectrum of, um, things that they can become experts on or things that they are familiar with and are working on. So if you're kind of bored of something one day, you can work on something else the other day. So, I mean, we have contracts right now. We get to work on the Dream Chaser. Um, we are actually designing the uh, radiators for the Dream Chaser space vehicle. Um, we're doing the humidity control subsystem for the CST-100. Yep, there she is. Um, and uh, so we have larger contracts like that on top of our, you know, our, we have our NASA contracts and SBIRs associated with that. Very nice. <clears throat> so it sounds like you folks are plenty busy, um, but I have a question for you personally. So what yeah. ultimately inspired you to even get into this industry and specifically in life support systems? Oh, life support systems. So I think um, I've always been infatuated with space um, since I was a little girl. So I always knew that I wanted to be an engineer and I went and got my mechanical engineering degree um, and I started my career in aerospace actually. So I actually worked on aircrafts before I moved into the space industry. But um, I had an astronomy professor in my undergraduates program. Uh, his name was A. James Malman. And he's, I think, really one of the people who pushed me into my, I already knew that I loved space, but making me think about space as a career option instead of as just something that I enjoyed as a hobby. And um, while I was working at Rockwell, um, I heard about the University of North Dakota space program. I was Googling and I was like, what is the best space programs in the world? And um, it's a program up at the University of North Dakota. And they, it was a help, actually Buzz Aldrin helped uh, found it. And they have such an amazing curriculum there. Um, I applied to see if I could do it uh, kind of as an online um, option while I was working full time as an aerospace engineer. And when I went up for orientation after I had been a, an online student for a while, I got to see some of the laboratories that they worked in and the things that um, I could have been a part of if I went there full time and I couldn't say no. So I got the um, choice essentially of different programs or, or projects that I wanted to work on. And I just fell in love with life support, uh, specifically bioregenerative physical chemical hybrid life support systems. So that's utilizing living uh, organisms, higher plants, algae, uh, bacteria, and things of that nature in order to provide life support in extreme environments. So I got to help uh, develop the greenhouse module for the inflatable lunar Martian habitat. Uh, it's a NASA funded program of the University of North Dakota. The same habitat that I actually got to do my first analog mission in. So I guess that was kind of my introduction into analog missions as well. And um, I, there's something that just makes you wanna get up in the morning and go to work. Um, 
And when I was an aerospace engineer and I worked on aircrafts, it was interesting. Don't get me wrong. But I mean, I would have mornings where I'd hit the alarm button four or five times <laughs> before I'd get up. Now it's not like that anymore. Now I dream about my job. I think about it in the shower. I think about it all the time. It's, it's a new sense of fulfillment that I am really excited to have in my life. And that is so fascinating because it, it really does say something when, you know, you can literally spring out of bed and, as you said, feel fulfilled. What aspect of it makes you feel fulfilled? I mean, is it the the fact that you're developing things that are going to further humanity's reach in space, um, which is a huge thing unto itself? But can you kind of dive more into that, like what, what that passion is? Yeah, for sure. I think one of the issues that I've had in a lot of my uh, previous uh, roles internally um, was that I just... I would get, I get bored doing the same thing over and over again. So in this specific role, you're not only working on programs that get to keep astronauts alive in space, you're adding to our scientific discovery as a race, you know, as a human race, um, you get to continually learn and education is just fundamentally part of me. Like I love learning new things. I love bettering my understanding of the things around me and how everything around us is and why and how we can, you know, develop more knowledge about these things. Because I think the more that I learn, the more I realize I don't know anything. Isn't that the problem with education? With every answer you get, you get 30 more questions. And then on top of that, to I have such a great crew of people that I work with. So that is also uh, just a major bonus. Um, we have a pretty small group. We're less than 50 people in our company, but the talent that is there is outstanding and the passion for space is absolutely ingrained in every single person that I work with. So it doesn't feel like a chore even when we're like working long hours because you can just, you can feel the excitement I think between me and a lot of the other people that are in our company and um, being able to do that. And then on top of that, working so many different programs at the same time and having your hand and like you, we're not providing small bits to the programs. Like I really feel like everything that people have to contribute is a large contribution and just having that satisfaction and that, you know, that pride that goes with knowing that you did something. I remember my very first uh, program was assigned to me. I like looked at myself after taking my job and I was like, Oh my God, I don't know if I can do that. Like, I'm going to be fired immediately. This is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember this, I picked up a bunch of my textbooks. I started learning. Um, one of my coworkers, Thomas Kenyatta, um, he really helped me out and kind of pushed me in the direction because it was, it was a uh, highly thermal um, uh, and fluids problem. And I hadn't, I hadn't done thermal in a very long time since I had been in college. So um, I had to write this mathematical model and uh, something else I had not ever really done. Uh, and the guidance and the, the sense of pride I had when I finished that and it was a fully functioning model to sit back and be like, holy macro, like I just made this and this can predict things that are going to happen in space. This is going to influence the way that we design our machinery here so that it functions correctly, both on our test floor down here and then once it's launched. I mean, that's a feeling that I don't know if I could get, you know, socially or elsewhere. So it's um, it's special. And a lot of people in our chat room um, are are. In, it's absolutely enthused of your infectious enthusiasm. Enthused of your enthusiasm uh, with that. Thing. <laughs> well said. And um, and a lot of them are. I mean, multiple people have asked, like, what are your favorite projects that you've worked on in like the entirety of your career so far? Oh, okay. So the program that's nearest and dearest to my heart is a program called Ira. So um, uh, that's an a water processor and essentially. So it, it uses uh, a hybrid approach, which I was telling you earlier is kind of uh, my thing. So essentially what happens is on a, a Martian surface, it doesn't have to be Mars, I suppose. It can be any celestial body. I mean, heck, it, it could be Earth too. It could be um, anywhere. But let's, let's use Mars uh, as an analog here. 
Um, so in a habitat, uh, all of the water that is used from the crew um, would be is collected. So that's urine, um, that's you know wastewaters, that's runoff, that's uh, condensation collection, um, that's uh, water runoff from your greenhouse. It's a uh, hand washing water. Um, it's a shower or laundry water. And all of this is collected and pumped into something. It's um, a, a bioreactor that's been developed by Texas Tech University, um, run by a man named Andrew Jackson. And he's our technical partner um, on this program. And essentially, they use microbes to, to treat um, this, this, your, this gray water, essentially. Um, and it studies the pH. So at that point in time, we pump that now um, pH study effluent into a system, which is uh, where I kind of take over. Um, me and oh, we have a team of about two or three people. And um, we have designed essentially a way to reclaim that water. So we use a distillation process and um, a few other things I'm not sure I'm allowed to talk about um, in order to regenerate that water into being potable. So we're essentially taking that water that would be discarded and making it drinkable again so that we can close the loop on board on like, I guess, uh, hopefully I, I want it to work on board uh, microgravity conditions, but right now it's, um, it's designed for gravity environments. So celestial body. Um, dare I ask, what, do you know what the efficiency of that, that system is? Is that something you can, or is that sort of the quiet things you can't talk about? Yeah, um, well, the efficiency, we're actually in phase two right now. So um, for anybody who doesn't know how the phases of development work, there's a phase one, essentially, and that's more uh, mathematical development. It's a uh, proof of concept sort of stuff, more paper studies, maybe small development um testing and then there's a down selection at that point as you move into phase two and at phase two is kind of fun because you start to get you get to make your prototypes so you get to make these full functioning systems they don't necessarily have to be uh, flight hardware because you're doing ground-based testing on it and you're just um you're you're doing you know characterization of your system essentially and you're learning about uh, what your designs um, are capable of actually producing. So it's moving from that theoretical into uh, that practical or actual uh, uh, testing phase. And we, um, it, it's a two year portion that we're in there. And then from there, there's a final down selection out of phase two and then phase three is uh, typically the system that goes into like experimental space testing. So we are nearing uh, the last probably quarter of our uh, phase two effort. So we've gotten actually a full functioning system up and running. And we were doing standalone testing here for a while. And the fun thing about that is there's specific funding that is available to phase two. So you're not allowed to spend more than a certain amount of money. So the way that you would actually design it in space is slightly different because you're going to take into consideration things like efficiency, um, especially thermal and electrical efficiency. You're going to take that into account much more in final fabrication or design. So we kind of take um, we kind of take a garage approach for some of those things that aren't necessary for full functionality. So um, it's hard to say right now exactly what the efficiency of the system would be, but it's pretty impressive the way that it is, even though it's not in flight condition yet. And, you know, in life support, you obviously have to deal with things like scrubbing carbon dioxide, or in this case, like you're working on reclaiming water. Um, what are some things that uh, in, in learning and developing life support systems, or just anything in what you've developed that really surprised you? Like you were completely not expecting this to become an issue, and that is something that's kind of blew you away that you had to consider that. I think that one of the coolest things um, in my education was a learning about how space truly affects um, the human body. Um, and also um, just the 
I think maybe the thing that I find most interesting is hypoxia, actually, if we're going to be honest. And that would be a, uh, the body's reaction to having a, a lack of oxygen. And they've done a ton of testing on this, and it's super interesting. I mean, it's it's something that even after I've finished my education on and I've learned about, it's something I still like to do some uh, research on on my own because I just find it so incredibly curious. So hypoxia is something that a lot of high-altitude pilots also face. Um, but essentially the pressure inside of your cabin typically stays the same. So you don't feel a difference in, in physical pressure, but the partial pressure of oxygen, meaning the amount of oxygen in that same volume is less. So you could have maybe more nitrogen or more something else, but it's not something that your body's actually utilizing, right? Cause nitrogen is kind of a dead gas to us. So as that partial pressure of oxygen decreases and you're breathing in and consuming less oxygen, your body starts to do some pretty amazing and crazy things. Um, so there are a couple of uh, <laughs> there are a couple of um, chambers throughout the United States in which some of the uh, military pilots are trained for high altitude. Um, considerations and I've, a lot of astronauts are also trained to recognize their own signs of hypoxia because they're very different for each person. But essentially, um, they've had a lot of, of uh, demonstrations in which you'll have an astronaut or a, a pilot sitting there and they'll have their mask off and you can't really recognize yourself when you're beginning to become hypoxic. And one of the major side effects of hypoxia is actually euphoria. So it's something that most people, once they begin experiencing hypoxia, which is a lack of oxygen to your brain, your brain sort of starts functioning. In fact, um, I was lucky enough to be able to do some of the hypoxia training myself when I was up at the University of North Dakota. And a lot, a lot of very interesting things happen. Um, you become, you're very sure of yourself throughout the entire process of, uh, uh, oxygen depletion, essentially. So people will say things to you like, what's four plus four? And you're like, well, it's eight, you know, but as time goes on, they're still asking you these easy questions and you're still sure of yourself, but you're actually incorrect. So it's like, what's four plus three? And you're like, eight. And you're like, what's four plus three? And you're like, it's eight. And you know it, <laughs> you know, for certain that you are correct and that the answer is eight. And they'll have you write your name on these lines as time goes on. And you can look at the papers afterwards as it just becomes essentially nothing. They have you put these blocks that are just shapes into uh, matching shapes. You know, like the kids toys where uh -huh. you have to put the star in the star and the triangle mm -hmm. in the triangle mm -hmm. and such of that it becomes increasingly difficult. And maybe the most impressive thing I think is you start losing your ability to see color but you don't recognize that you're not seeing color. So they actually have you look at a sheet when they return oxygen to your body and all of a sudden the entire world becomes bright. And you had never realized that it had gone dark in the first place. And it's kind of a scary thing because they've done a lot of this testing with, high, with pilots and they'll yell at pilots and they'll say, your entire crew is gonna die if you don't put your mask back on right now. And such a tiny percentage, almost 0% of the pilots actually return the mask to their own face. They have to have somebody in there all times to put it on because the euphoria is so great that they choose not to. Wow. Yeah, I was about to say, you know, have, going up mountains uh, uh, frequently. Yeah, which you have a lot of experience with. Yeah, people, you, uh, people at altitude become belligerent. Um, Do you? Uh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, because uh, you can, you actually can, at least when you're going up mountains, it's not as dr drastic as you can in an altitude chamber um, with that. So you can kind of, you can kind of teach yourself to remove some of that yeah. um, from yourself. But yeah, things like that really do happen. You get euphoric and, and wow. you, you sort of get like I know when I get above 10,000 feet, I kind of get this tunnel vision kind of thing going. Yeah. Um, and then also really too, altitude sickness um, effect or altitude affects everybody differently. Some mm -hmm. people will become, some people will be incredibly fit, but completely crippled by altitude sickness. And then there will be people who are like 
not fit at all. This is like their first time going up at altitude and they're like they're breezing past everybody <laughs> super fast. Some people get headaches. Some people uh -huh. start doing other body processes. I will not uh, Go throw into. on everybody, but yeah, it's just, I gotta agree. Hy hypoxia is amazing uh, if for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, I was gonna so. say, so essentially at first I was gonna compare hypoxia to having one too many drinks. Cause that whole just overly confident four plus three is eight thing, like uh, yeah, we've all been there. But then when you started getting into the more <laughs> like the more abstract like you can't see colors and all of this it's like okay this is beyond just a few drinks this is like brain chemistry messing around stuff yeah well actually drinking alcohol uh starts a process that's very similar to hypoxia i'm gonna actually call it hypoxia because um your uh, oxygen content that's delivered to your brain is also diminished so Next time you're walking down the street and somebody tries to ask you what's wrong, you can tell them you're hypoxic. Ooh, and <laughs> yeah, they're not going to know what's up. They're going to be so. like, do, do you need Yeah, I'm not drunk, I'm somewhere? hypoxic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. They're like, is that contagious? Uh, yeah. If you want a double whammy, drink alcohol at altitude. Wow. So, which I don't recommend. Uh, I don't that's, think that's so, a great idea. Nobody's recommending that. Nobody is recommending do that. Don't do it. It's um, terrible. So. And so I guess, um, and I've seen a couple of questions in the chat uh, that are related to this, but a, a question I have is, so, you know, you have these suits and these systems that, you know, are to accommodate for and kind of diminish the, the crazy environment of space, but how do you go about testing these suits? I mean, I know that human testing can only go so far, but then, like, how do you test them so that you know for a fact they're ready to go into space with a human yeah. inside of them? For sure. So actually, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but in 2014, uh, Paragon broke a world record by sending Alan Eustatius um, to about 100, just shy of 136,000 feet, where he um, successfully completed the highest space dive um, on record. So um, essentially a gondola balloon uh, in, inflates as it, as it goes up into the atmosphere and uh, took Alan with him, and then he uh, releases himself from that and fell back to Earth, essentially, in a super uh, high-altitude uh, space jump. So um, Paragon um, was the company who got to design his suit, and um, actually he we designed the, basically every component um, of that, other than, I think, the balloon itself. And... Um, uh, we actually got a system in house. It's called the EHF, um, and it's in uh, it's a chamber. It's a vacuum chamber essentially that is human rated. So you can put. Uh, we've tested several spacesuits actually also inside of this, and we can control everything between the makeup of gases in there. We can it, we can pull a vacuum. We can um, incorporate. Uh, condensation or humidity. Um, so we get to change the environment however we want to. And um, we can put any kind of sensors that we want um, into the system. And we just make sure that it's at a place that is safe to maintain life before we ever try anything with a human. Yeah. Mm -hmm. awesome. yeah. that's, so that's, go I gotta say, <laughs> jumping from 136,000 feet sounds awesome. Uh so. Yes. I'm down. Of course Let's you are. Let's do it. I'd sign up. Okay. Yeah. Yes. All right. So this perfectly goes into my next question, which was actually asked by Graham from YouTube. They asked, um, would you consider going to space if the opportunity arises? And I think this is a very unique question for you specifically, since you have firsthand experience working with the system that is ultimately going to keep you alive. Would you go up there? I would actually. Um, and this answer I think has changed for me throughout time. And I, if would I go to space, certainly. Would I take a trip that had a one-way ticket to Mars, for example, to never come back? I don't think so. Um, as much as I love space, I also love um, the comforts of, uh, I don't know, I like trees and birds and going for hikes and breathing in as much oxygen as I want to. So eventually I would like a return ticket. But if the opportunity um, came up where I was offered a trip to Mars or anywhere else in the solar system, and I had a Paragon life support systems on board, I would be very confident in taking that trip and beyond excited. So if there's anybody out there that wants to fund my trip to Mars, let me know. <laughs> Straight up. up. <laughs> 
I'm on board. <laughs> and that's like the ultimate endorsement. Like I have so much trust in these suits that I would use them and go up in space in them. So nice. <laughs> All right, Brittany, I believe you. Uh, so um, I just want to kind of uh, get a question from Rebel in our IRC chat room. Um, because you, know, you talked about Paragon making the pressure suit for Alan to do his, uh, his, his super high skydive. Um, and Rebel's asking, how long does it take to create a suit from development to usage? And will this increase in speed and lower costs much with the commercial and tourist future? Plus, you know, a lot of sizes and use cases, because obviously, you know, a couple weeks ago, still kind of trailing with that spacesuit issues on the space station. So uh, kind of how long does it take and, and what's that looking like? Uh, I think that the space, uh, I mean, the Stratex uh, program uh, went pretty fast. It only took a couple of years. Um, but I think to develop a line of spacesuits that was applicable for, you know, to, to accommodate all different types of astronauts, which, of course, anybody would want to do, it would take a, a great deal of time longer than that. I know that they've been working on, um, I think, the NDX uh, series of spacesuits up at the University of North Dakota under uh, Pablo de Leon. Uh, for quite a few years. And that's a testament to he is such a hard worker and intelligent, has such a good team around him also. But it takes a lot of time to make sure these things are right. And in my opinion, it's something that you need to take the time to do because, uh, you know, uh, public opinion uh, plays into how much funding we get um, in our industry quite a bit. And they don't take well to you making a mistake once or twice. It's one of those industries where you succeed or, you know, the first time around or, or you're out. Um, when you're, when you have people's lives in your hands, it's not really something that you get to rush. It's not something that you get to take corners on. Um, and of course you want to develop things as quickly as you can, but you also have to make sure that you're, you're stopping and taking the time to check every single thing that needs to be checked. And you have somebody that you trust looking over your shoulder and, you're going through the correct phases of develop, development with the correct people to make sure that these things are done in an appropriate manner because um, because it matters. And so time-wise, I think it would depend. Um, and I don't know if you guys know this, but the development of spacesuits, it's not like you get to design one spacesuit that is applicable for all applications. A lunar spacesuit is extremely different than a Martian spacesuit, which is extremely different from an intravehicle spacesuit, which is extremely different from a microgravity EVA suit. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, yes, the environments um, and the pressurization of those environments, but also something I think a lot of people don't know is that um, the regolith on these different celestial bodies are incredibly different. So here we're used to our sand um, being very rounded because we have all of these uh, natural processes and we have this pressure that's on us and we have the, we have our our uh, natural modes of um, essentially a rubbing down created um, uh, by the pressures both under sea and the pressures that are put upon us by um, by our just the you know just the atmosphere essentially. So um, these processes uh, are lessened once you're on Mars, um, and then even further lessened. Um, when you're in somewhere like uh, the, the lunar surface. So the lunar surface actually has regolith that is not rounded down at all. They're very sharp. If you look at it under a microscope, and we've gotten a lot of um, regolith back from some of our earlier missions, um, you can see that it's essentially little daggers. So um, we had some issues um, in the first line of development of our spacesuits that actually went up to the moon because we were getting microabrasions and tears in our spacesuits from conditions that we weren't quite ready for. So it's not like you can make just a one suit fits all or a one suit goes on any mission sort of deal. So you kind of have to end up with, you know, a lot of things or, or specifically develop suits for the conditions that you're, you're trying to, you know, use them in. Wow. Yeah. And it's a, uh... Quite a multitude of those two, um, and to kind of <laughs> kind of go with that. Uh, Karth Naren from our YouTube chat um, is asking, how effective is it to create a spacesuit from carbon fiber from multiplanetary environments? I guess kind of what are like what are the materials that you have to use in order to make a spacesuit? Oh man, I'm not really that familiar with it. Most of my programs are in the life support systems for uh, 
spacecraft applications and for habitation. Um, but uh, I don't know if I've ever seen a spacesuit made from carbon fiber. Um, I would think that, you know, we have a lot of issues. Essentially, you're always pressurizing and depressurizing spacesuits. I think that carbon fibers, especially maybe a bit, you know, they're not very flexible. So I think that would cause a lot of issues um, in the fabrication of a spacesuit. Um, so durability, I think, is one of the things that we care a lot about. Like you do have um, a lot of things that will rub up in high um high lifetime cycles, essentially, that'll be used for a spacesuit. So you're looking for durability. Um, you're also looking for a, like breathability, right? We have lots of different layers. It's not like one material makes up a spacesuit. It's not like it's not like our clothes where we just weave one thing together. There are different layers of a spacesuit that perform different functions um, for the environments that we're planning to work on. And um, so I think that question would be better suited to specific layers of a spacesuit rather than just the material of a spacesuit. A spacesuit is made of lots of materials. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would hope so. I would hope it's not just like something that you can slap together and like go to space. And it's like, I can't imagine how <laughs> immensely complex it is and for good reason. And um, there's a really great question from Destructor1701 from YouTube. And this is kind of... Um, a look into the future. And they ask, does Paragon have a strategy in mind for serving the potential space boom over the next decade? I'm thinking end user spacesuits, plug and play life support for HABs, et cetera. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, so um, I think that we actually have a, a system that we've already designed that is, is super cool um, down in kind of like our museum. And essentially we have already developed a kind of plug and play life support system, essentially. Um, it houses a, uh, a TCCA, a trace contaminant control assembly, which is responsible for taking out um, any particles that are in the environment. If there were to ever be a fire, it's a fire, mit fire particle mitigation system. Um, it works uh, to pull humidity um, uh, out of the, the cabin air. Um, it does carbon dioxide scrubbing. Um, so sort of your, like your air revitalization. Um, it uh, has um, all of these components that are necessary essentially to maintain uh, the cabin environment. And we originally designed it to be um, usable for seven crew and it's not a very big unit. Um, so set, they have these little dials too, where you can essentially um, dial in and out um, the function of each of these individual components of the life support system to, to hone in on how many crew members you have. So if you only have four, you can kind of move the dial to four, right? I mean, there's not a dial that says four, but that's essentially the idea. And we have this entire unit that is capable of adapting to different crew sizes instead of continually redesigning the life support system every time that the mission plan changes and you have a different number of crew that is planned to, um, you know, uh, go on these, especially for long-term, uh, long-duration space flights. And I think that we're actually a little bit ahead of our industry. I think that one day this is going to be something that is insanely useful and we're just kind of, uh, waiting for the rest of the industry to catch up. Wow, so you're talking about like a modular life support system for a HAB. That yes, is, I am. That is so Very cool. cool. And actually to kind of go into that um, a little bit, uh, blackboxcamera.com on YouTube uh, is asking, what is the longest duration that a spacecraft life support system is able to operate for without resupply? And I kind of want to throw a little bit on there too, um, because if you go to Mars and you do a mission that returns, that's, it's, that's at best case, you know, shortest duration three years. Um, so that means your mm -hmm. life support system has to work effectively for three years continuously minimum yes so, <laughs> okay. like yeah for sure what are the what are the challenges of do of developing a system like that like what are the huge problems what are those hurdles oh my gosh are there are many um but i guess i'll start on my kind of bioregenerative spiel here because that's very near and dear to my heart but we're currently we have uh three different approaches uh for maintaining 
essentially life support um, for these missions. Um, one of those is complete resupply. Like you mentioned, we're constantly sending goods out. Um, and then we have a bioregenerative approach. And that is the approach that I care about uh, that is like nearest and dearest to my heart. And that is essentially using, like I said before, um, living organisms to provide a portion of your life support. Because, I mean, we have microbes or bacteria or higher plants. This thing right here, um, am I pointing the right way? They're my plant. Um, <laughs> that naturally, it's a natural CO2 scrubber. It takes CO2 out of the environment and it pumps oxygen in. That's exactly what half of our physical chemical systems do, which is the third approach, by the way, is physical chemical. It's essentially using filters, chemicals, mechanical processes to provide life support. And um, it's a very interesting thing because uh, bioregenerative approaches also have the ability to provide us nutrients. Um, they clean water. We can pour dirty water essentially in the base of plants and we can transpire clean water out of the leaves of the plants and then condense that later and collect it. This plant is doing, you know, three or four of the jobs that I've been working for a very long time trying to design in a mechanical sense. So there's an interesting, there's an interesting dichotomy, I would say, that exists because a lot of engineers don't really appreciate the the science behind biology because the stability of it is concerning. It's, it's hard to predict and engineers like to be able to predict everything that's going to happen. And then you have these systems that are plausibly autonomous. Like once you get them started, they could last for, you know, like a long time, hundreds of years. I would uh, suspect if you had the right approaches to it, the downside of that being the nutrient cycle, which we're still looking into, but it is long periods of time. Um, and the difference here is um, way back when we were starting essentially this space race, um, we had these ideas. NASA was doing research um, on algae and higher plants in order to pursue a bioregenerative approach to life support. But when you're just going to the moon and back, or when you're just going to Leo, you know, um, that's not that necessary. You can get there so quickly and back um, that it, it almost makes sense to perform resupply as, as, you know, your approach. But as you're moving further and further and out, out into our solar system for extended times, when you're moving into long duration space flight, you can't have rendezvous missions that are expected to hurry up and get there and resupply these things. So now you, you get to a place where you're really in need of autonomous systems and bioregenerative is really peaking its head. And the engineers are correct in saying that we do have some issues in stability. I mean, we don't exactly understand what could happen in, in radiation conditions that change the makeup of certain microbes that are in the soils or are internally to plants and how that might change things. What if we have one certain thing that wipes out a bunch of our, uh, you know, a bunch of our plants, we have ways of companion planting and doing things that ensure that that is much less likely. I think that the real approach for future duration is, um, is a hybrid approach. So it's pairing, uh, bioregenerative approaches with physical chemical approaches. So it's kind of a buddy system. And um, we have progressed down the physical chemical road because of, you know, NASA's push during the space race, essentially. We knew so much more about physical chemical systems by the time we were kind of in that race to the moon that it both made sense logistically and, you know, and in a sense of research and what we had still um, to learn. So how long can we support people? If we take bioregenerative physical chemical approaches, <laughs> a long time. <laughs> good answer. Way longer than three years. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, so as we wind down, before we say goodbye, I really want to address the elephant in the room, which takes form as a hole in the wall. And a lot of folks in our chat, including Jared and I, are really concerned because I don't know if you know this, but right behind you, there is a hole in the wall yeah. that basically is exposing you to the vacuum of space. And we're really worried because you seem to be fine. Don't look now. Oh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, and so can you just <laughs> please um, explain explain that? Because we're all quite worried that the, you just have the vacuum of space like right there and you're still lovely and healthy, but you know. 
Yeah, it's 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 a paradigm, you know. I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> I'm really into space decor, um, and I'm also really into Doctor Who. So this kind of uh, reminded me of kind of like the crack in the universe. Yes. How the Time Lords are trying to bust through my wall. So um, I just like to surround my things self and things that make me happy, and this is one of them. Nice. Well, it's spectacular, <laughs> and it really does serve as kind of like the perfect backdrop for this entire interview. So. Uh, thanks for kind of getting <laughs> I think there. anywhere in my house would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Well, Brittany, thank you so much for talking with us today. Um, we're really excited to see the evolution of life support systems because that is basically what is going to enable humankind to progress further and further into space. So thank you for the work that you do, and thank you for inspiring so many others, whether you know it or not. Um, so if our viewers would like to learn more, where can we send them? Um, you can check out, um, I think, uh, Paragon has a Twitter account. Yep. At Paragon SDC. We'd love to answer any of your questions. Also, you can find me, um, either on Facebook or on Instagram and I would love to talk space. I can talk space all day long. So if you have any questions, uh, Brittany Zimmerman on both of them, um, on Instagram, I'm at astronaut.brittany.c. Wonderful. Well, thanks again. Um, thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful weekend. But before we say goodbye, we would like to give a very thoughtful acknowledgement to our citizens of tomorrow. These folks, all of them, um, they all essentially help make this show happen and give us meaning and purpose. As you can see, there are several names up there as we go on through the different echelons. Um, all of these folks contribute a certain amount of money per month, and if you would like to become one, you can head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. Look at that beautiful, beautiful yeah. wall of text. Mm. <laughs> and just Actually, my name's on there now. <laughs> I am now a supporter Yay! of my own dreams. And also, you know, you don't have to <laughs> financially support us as well. You can head over to community.tmro.tv and actually uh, you know, help us out in whatever ways that you can. Can you code? Can you do really cool graphic designs? Yeah. Uh, can you subscribe to us? Can you like us? Can you ring the bell? Can you put it on your Facebook <laughs> or whatever you got? So just yeah. share it around and it, show, us, exactly. show us to everybody that you Please. can. Please, and if you can't make it rain monetarily, make it rain emotionally. Uh, share us with your friends and family. Get the word out about space. Just be you. And on that note, thank you so much for joining us. This was Tomorrow Space Orbit 12.13, and we will see you folks next week. Goodbye.